I resume the recording and I'm doing a cloud recording because I'm not sure. I mean, I'm sure I can't stay for the whole call today. Um, just I'm working on a really tight deadline and I need to, you know, I, so I'm going to be here for the first half hour and kind of start the conversation and then you guys can continue and I'll have to see the recording. It'll be really distributed governance. We'll be able to distribute the responsibility. Um, so maybe just do a quick check-in given the times that we're at like how maybe everybody can just um if this well just introduce themselves briefly and then maybe say how this current situation is affecting them or whatever they want to share about where they're at right this second or whatever they need to maybe just get off their chest before we start a conversation um oh look i have a reminder to be here um cool so um I'm Grace, I'm in Slovenia. I work uh, with Hollow and about half time and I work doing all kinds of writing and consulting uh, in the area of DAOs and ICOs for the rest of my time. I've been in this space for about three years and I got interested in decentralized governance uh, even though I didn't know what to call it at the time of the Arab Spring. I'm Israeli and I thought we need new forms of governance, new forms of democracy. And so here I am 10 years later. That's me. Um, and how the crisis is affecting me, obviously the liquidity in the markets has been really difficult for me and the people who are my clients. Um, Slovenia is in a total shutdown, which doesn't affect my work very much because I work from home anyway. So here I am. And I'm going to call on Martin as the next person to speak. Just call, when you finish, just call on the next person. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm Martin Dow. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, um, I've come into the sort of Dow space via um, a spell working on delegated proof of stake blockchains and understanding uh, perhaps the limit limitations of those the limitation of let's say of uh, naive voting mechanisms and um uh last year started working on um cooperative projects which uh, um it, it's all built around the foundations of viable systems so uh it was a great introduction to working on holistic frameworks and and really the relationships between people um and tech not just tech uh, <laughs> Um, and trying to sort of have sort of theoretical models of how people work together. So um, dealing with the, the infinite uh, richness of how people behave um, and making that central uh, was how I then really uh, kind of got excited about working on polychain as a, as, as a, as a pattern as well as a concrete technology. Um, and uh, yeah. So uh, I've, I've come to this group via Grace. Thank you, Grace. And, um, and I've also uh, got an introduction to, to Lauren as well. Uh, doing some work. So that's been marvelous so far. So, uh, um, and yeah, I'm actually talking from the UK uh, where I usually work from. Uh, I frequently work from home where I live in Ireland and I crossed over a national boundary last night 
Um, so that's quite interesting from a local context <laughs> point of view, and it is different. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I suspect the, the walls will go up over the Irish Sea uh, in, um, in you know, next week or something. So I have to collect a, a load of things and get, a, get all the UK stuff out of the way where I have to actually be here. So um, yeah, strange times. I saw my first masks last night on the ferry and it was a really strange thing. Uh, living as I do in, in, uh, in an area of self-isolation at the best of times in rural West of Ireland. That's where <laughs> so look, um, I'll shut up now. Over to, well, why not, uh, Lauren? Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Lauren, and um, I'm in lockdown in Paris. Uh, it's pretty much martial law here. You're not supposed to go out unless you have a special permission. You need a papers to go outside the house now. Uh, we saw some uh, tanks being brought in, so they're getting ready. <laughs> and uh, I run something called uh, KikoLab, KikoLab.org, and it's all about um, hosting uh, collective intelligence roundtables. And so that's me and um, uh, Jeff. You there? Ready? Yep, I am. Um, yeah, I've been working on a project called the Common Stack, which is working to establish uh, token engineering and uh, build DAO components that uh, we can buy and use for different contexts. Uh, one that is particularly relevant in this kind of situation would be local community currencies. Um, and I think that although I'm not really affected by the lockdown, I work from my basement just like I did before, but there are a lot of people um, that are extremely affected by this. It's also showing a lot of the um, shortcomings of our current economic models of perpetual growth and uh, labor as value. So it would be really interesting to see uh, what kind of assumptions we can test over the coming weeks and months. Value and currency system people may be open to that. Uh, you know, just a few weeks ago, would have seemed like fantasy. So, I think it's also offered talks as an opportunity to explore. Um, I'm pretty, uh, you know, there's a silver lining perhaps to, to all of this. So, um, and I will pass it to Mark. Thanks, Jeff. Your uh, microphone's pretty bad. You might want to play with something there. We can, we can okay, just hear you. sorry. Uh, I think I got that okay. fixed now. Cool. Uh, so my name is Mark Pascal. Uh, yeah, as I said before, two o'clock in the morning here in New Zealand. Uh, I've been involved in the blockchain space for too many years now. I uh, brought uh, I spent a week with uh, brought Vitalik and Andreas over a few years ago for a conference. Spent a week with them, and uh, I've run the blockchain association in New Zealand. I've presented to Parliament. I've founded a uh, organization called Blockchain Labs. We did a lot of audits in 2017 craziness and uh, now running a consulting called the DAO Agency, uh, really focusing on uh, educating consulting in, in the DAO space. So super interested in all this stuff. I was part of the Genesis DAO for a little while uh, and a partner in Meta Cartel Venture DAO uh, and yeah, just starting to get really interested in the common stack stuff uh really that that really aligns with sort of my values and uh my interest in this space uh using sort of this technology the DAO technology for for common good so uh yeah really excited about that and uh yeah so this this situation hasn't really hit new zealand yet we've got eight i think 20 cases now uh and but i think it'll it'll get here so yeah they're talking about shutting schools and stuff so uh It'll, it'll happen. Okay, I'll pass it on to uh, Juliana. Hello, everybody. Uh, I came here thanks to the Telegram channel of uh, DGOV. I met them at Web3 Summit back last year. It's been two years that I'm in the blockchain space. And uh, I'm recently very interested in DAOs. Um, it was never a topic of, of, of something that I always knew it was about, but I was never engaged in the discussions until I became a summoner 
of uh, as, as we heard about Meta Cartel and uh, all what they evolved in the past year. And not only Meta Cartel, but Eat Denver this year was all about DAOs. So we created a DAO for women called Meta Gamma Delta, which is also like a small arm of a Meta Cartel. And I thought there's no better way to start better than pressing the buttons and starting to deploy a DAO. And that's what we did. So it's been about a month that I'm very involved. And uh, it's, it's amazing how much we can do and explore and, and get it going uh, with this new vehicle of uh, participation. So I'm here because I'm interested in the discussions coming up. I saw the calendar, uh, looks like very interesting, exciting, not just about democracy, but many of the topics that you're, you're bringing to discussion. So I'm here to be part of the next following calls as well. This is not a one-time thing. Um, I'm based in Sao Paulo. Over here, we are at day four of the chaotic situation. It's around 350 cases. Uh, we're already uh, at least trying to close and, and, and get all the schools uh, stopping to work. And then so far, people can still circulate. Yesterday was the first time I've been to the supermarket. It looks like the 80s. Um, chaotic, like people buying until there's no tomorrow. We are going to have inflation. Inflation already hit our currency. And uh, our president, as you might probably have heard, he lives in a bubble. He thinks this is hysteria. He uh, said we're not going to close any of the borders. So around six flights from Germany were arriving when United States blocked European flights. So they're all coming from Brazil to Miami. And uh, it's crazy that now they, they decided to close the, the borders with Venezuela. So the president is seriously on a very complicated cognitive dissonance. He has no empathy about those that are sick or dying and uh, just talking about his Twitter and his followers. And it's, it's really, really sad what's happening in the democracy of my country. So um, pretty much in, in this chaotic situation, that's when we hopefully uh, are going to see new potential powers and uh, impressive minds coming up. And I'm going to pass the ball to, let's see, Grace spoke, Mark, Lauren, Martin, Jeff. I think, Gus, you are next. Thank you, Juliana. Uh, yes, I'm Gustavo. I know some, some of you. Uh, Lauren, great to see you after, after Dalfest in, in Paris. Um, who am I? Well, I'm in the, in the Ethereum ecosystem since four years ago, less. I jumped into Ethereum just after the, the DAO pieces. Um, the whole thing about DAOs just impressed me back then and it's still impressed me today. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. I'm Venezuelan. I'm, I'm also very, uh, I'm, I'm very much into, I've been all my life into politics to the time in the in which I realized that we can't rely on politicians, we can't rely on on central organization. Uh, I look forward to a world in which we can organize and coordinate where we're solved in a, in a bottom up way. Um, I'm happy to hear. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm not. I don't know if, if that's if that's fair or not. But about the, the 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 news that in Brazil Bolsonaro is not closing their borders because I'm actually looking forward to to Brazil in the short term. So maybe you will have me over there soon. And um, yeah, right now I'm working with uh, Blockchain for Humanity, which is a, a foundation based in, in Switzerland, which is basically looking forward to catalyze all kind of efforts around building a social impact uh, with blockchain as, as, as a tool. I'm talking about projects, venture capitalists, uh, communities. We are trying just to gather together all these people and, and build synergies, whatever we see that there is room for that. So I guess I was the last one, right? Yeah, so pass the word to the moderator. <laughs> 
All right, great. So, um, fantastic. So it's actually kind of fun to do the introductions every every few weeks, even though you know most most of the time we just kind of dive right into it. So that was actually kind of great. Um, so we're going to talk today about transparency versus efficiency, which actually isn't a topic that I think about very much. So it's great if people will just jump in a little bit more. Um, so there's a thought around, well, everything should be transparent. And one of the problems with everything is transparent, everybody knows everything is not everybody wants everything to be transparent. If you have a distributed organization, to some degree, you want to take decisions together, but to take a decision, you need to have good information. And good information means you know what's going on. So you would think that's transparency. Um, I guess given the times that we're in, it would be even relevant just to talk about transparency in the current situation. So for example, the health organizations would like to know what everybody's status are. Are you staying home? Are you not staying home? And then there's people and people have a life and people are getting together and saying, hey, uh, we've got a lot of kids at home, let's homeschool together, which you're not supposed to do. Now, you'd want to know that information if you're the authorities, but then people don't want to give you that information because they could get in trouble. So there's that kind of aspect around it. And it's the same around um, a company, right? If you're in a company and again, your company, let's say right now is going through hard times and say, listen, we're gonna have to reduce everybody's salaries. You wanna know how much the CEO is making. You wanna know how much everybody's making, or maybe you don't. So how much transparency do you need in a DAO to make great decisions? And the other thing that was brought up, which is transparency versus efficiency, which is, there's a couple of aspects of that. For me, one of the aspects is just if there's so much information, you can't function or you can't make decisions. But I think people were talking more about from a computing aspect, if there's too much transparency, then the computing system gets less efficient. And I'm not sure how that works. I mean, in a blockchain, that may be an issue as well. Um, so basically, yeah, that's the issue that we want to talk about today. And I'd love to hear what people are dealing with, what kinds of DAOs you're creating, and where transparency is an issue, what the implications are, what your DAO has decided on. So this is, and maybe anything you have to ask the group about, hey, we're considering this for our DAO around transparency. What, you know, what do people think and what have people done? So um, people can just either raise their hand or we've been using a talking stick, like whoever wants it, I pass it to them. You have any, it can be any item that you happen to have. Um, I thought there was going to be an escalation and people were going to bring better, better items every week, but that hasn't happened. This is just, this, these are my reading glasses. So who would like the talking stick? Oh, it works, it works. Yes, it works, it works. Okay. I've suddenly only got my phone, so that's even more pathetic. Uh, I, I thought it was interesting, from my perspective, I think it's interesting to sort of differentiate between transparency between stakeholders. I mean, my view is, yes, if, if you've got tokens or if, if you're involved in governments or if you've got some sort of skin in the game, then yes, this whole notion of radical transparency is pretty important and the idea of reducing or eliminating sort of information asymmetry. But... Uh, I, I think it's worth differentiating between that sort of transparency between stakeholders and transparency into the world. Uh, I think there's a lot of situations where, yeah, as you highlighted, perhaps you don't want to be transparent outside your stakeholder group. Uh, so that, that, that I find can be useful differentiation. Uh, yeah, that's all I got to say. I don't mind jumping in. Uh, with a quick comment. Um, I think the tension here is that it needs to be navigated with more than a binary. It's not either opaque or transparent. And I think this is kind of the, the same simplification that we see in a lot of the blockchain space where people say, okay, if it's not a hierarchy, then it's completely flat. Uh, and I think this is like, you know, one of those things that we need to um, grow into the realization that we could have like access control uh, tiered layers of transparency, tiered layers of access, uh, 
um, you know, like we have in, in the real world in business organizations and so on, you know, certain levels of privilege, you get access to the financial reports and so on and so forth. Uh, and I think we can do that in our social situations and our nested communities and in DAOs uh, and so on. Uh, yeah, just a couple of thoughts on that. Can I get the stick? Grace, does it work with this? You have to ask the per yeah, that's, oh yeah, you can use that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yes, this is uh, my my uh, five second of- Sorry, uh, so that, that's why you prioritize over her instead of me, right? Just because she had your book. I didn't, I yeah, have listen, whoever should pick her is the person no, with the stick. I don't have the stick. <laughs> I didn't see your item, but it looks also exciting. If you want to go first, Gus, you're very welcome. Okay, my five minutes of uh, discussion to the transparency part. I've been four or five times to Sweden, which is one of the most ethical countries and where the society pretty much self-organizes uh, amazingly well. And to me, living uh, so many years in Latin America, and then in the Caribbean, where there's a lot of corruption and, and a lot of that, it took me a while to understand how ethics actually work. And I'll give an example. For example, over there, they can only throw cardboard paper on Wednesdays. They can only throw blue bottles in the garbage on Tuesdays, because that's when it gets collected. And the fact that if you have a pizza on a Sunday night, people will keep the cardboard at home until Wednesday. And I'm like, why people just do not throw it on Sunday? Isn't that fine, you know? No, because if I do that, my neighbor is going to see that uh, I'm throwing the cardboard on the wrong day, and then they're gonna be mad at me. And so this whole self um, um, paying attention and pretty much one spying on the other because everything is so transparent, helps uh, the, the whole morale and organization to work very nicely. On the other hand, you have like, if a politician goes to a store with a, a credit card of the government and spends like a coffee, uh, there's a journalist saying, you're spending that coffee with public money. So the level of transparency is total. However, uh, people spend so much time on self-regulating each other uh, that can be, I think, detrimental to the efficiency that Grace was pointing because people are now, instead of doing what they have to do, they're going to be controlling what the other one is doing instead of doing their work. So uh, I think maximum transparency is beneficial, but uh, it's also, uh, if you reach a level of everybody is already aware that their role is not just to be checking what the other is doing, but also to get things done. So on the efficiency part, I don't know if that's something good. It's interesting that the trade-off between uh, efficiency and resilience in, um, in kind of like network organizations. Uh, and I'm, your, your comment made me think of a, something I'd read recently about how the body responds to um, threats. And it's not in a kind of like one to many, like the government uh, doesn't tell you what to do. It's the cells around, uh, you know, cancer cells that respond. So it's a many to many response as opposed to a one to many response. So it's interesting, um, you know, the, the social dynamics that arise around um, issues like that. Um, like in Cape Town a couple of years ago when they had a drought, it suddenly became socially inappropriate to not shower with a bucket. And if you went to a friend's house and they didn't have a bucket in their shower to collect the extra water to use, um, you know, you were you were basically socially uh, excommunicated. So it's it's interesting. There's different social dynamics that um, can encourage behavior, as you mentioned. But uh, you're mentioning that it's a loss in efficiency, but it's also potentially a gain in resilience. So there's kind of a trade-off between these two. Um, forces in a, in a community. So uh, regarding, regarding if we are, uh, let's say, prioritizing efficiency over transparency, 
my personal take is that the priorities in that should be on, on the engagement because if we really want our organizations to that uh, value to what we want to do we need to promote the engagement through diversity somehow uh, i've seen DAOs in which yeah yeah they organize in such a way with uh, a smart contract but at the end of the day you may have just one two or maximum three persons doing the whole work around that doing the governance proposals and all of that and it, it could be convenient for the rest of people because what they will like to do is just maybe look forward to to understand information regarding a, a specific governance proposal uh, but that's in the best case scenario maybe in other DAOs where the information flows hasn't been let's say defined with the right protocols and DAOs members are actually uh, struggling to, to have the information about what's going on that could disengage people from 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 the DAO and in my view that's the worst uh, risk that the DAO could face it's in, in having disengagement and my personal take is that more transparency could, could promote more engagement from people and I don't, I don't think that efficiency in a DAO is something. I mean, I, I, I take for granted that this is something that uh, is not easy to achieve because you will have different views, different contexts, different cultures, and of course, uh, different different positions about a, a specific topic. So. And that's that's the thing that you confront diverse diverse point of view and look forward to take the, the best decision out of that. So give you the head. Uh, I think uh, I think a lot of times uh, we think of uh, transparency as being something like uh, privacy, uh, where their people will share what's going on or not because of kind of like um, you, whether they want to control that information or not. And I think a lot of times it's actually related to um, things like note taking, like when decisions are made, um, is there a record of that meeting? Can someone go back and see the process that the group went through? So a lot of times that, that you know, they make a decision together, they're not trying to be opaque, there's just no record of that. So it's really hard for another member or someone who wasn't there, maybe the meeting was open. And so it's not opaque. It's just, uh, you can't really go back and figure out the knowledge trail. So I just think that's another um, element in terms of making it out. If you wanna be transparent, it's not just like being open, but it's having, um, the information and knowledge trails available so people can figure out what's already been tried and why the um, the structure is the way it is. That's it. Just, just to, yeah, just to add to that, I that's yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think one of the problems currently in the sort of days mm -hmm. I've been involved with has been this. Yeah, there's this, all this information around decisions which get made on Discord channels or Telegram channels or there's all this massive flow of information and it's really hard to sort of keep up. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of that sort of decision making process and thought process gets buried in some sort of channel, which, you know, nobody has time to really filter through. So, yeah. Could I come in just, uh, with, with just with a humble water bottle, actually. Um, yeah, just to sort of pick up on the earlier point, which I think um, um, Jeff made, actually, um, about uh, it's not, not sort of to be, um, uh, you know, opaque or completely flat, um, and thinking about access controls. Um, so um, I, I think 
personally, this is an argument for um, um, building in uh, value around trust and reputation, really, between stakeholders. So that there is a sort of, um, you know, not one single view, perhaps, of, you know, access levels. Certainly not, you know, a binary choice of um, transparent or opaque. So that's, that's just one thing I want to, I mean, it's kind of a bit hollow chain centric, perhaps, this, this idea, but um, um, this is, uh, it makes sense to me. <laughs> and also be able to build architectures in a way that allow certain levels of sort of, um, let's say, a cross, um, uh, cross community, um, you know, multi-DAO almost, um, uh, uh, situations to be built. Uh, that's the end of the thought. So maybe I would ask people also specifically what DAOs are you talking like what specific use cases are there because I feel like we went through a number of things where people talked in general about some of the trade offs, but what are you dealing with in the DAOs that you're working on right now. And what questions might you have about implementations. So I think I'm going to add to Mark's point that so much of the discussions and also of Lauren's point that um, there is a lot of discussions and they all stay in the thread of a, a Telegram channel or a Discord channel. And it's very easy today with the amount of information uh, to get lost. And, that, and if you join like six months later, it's like why this was decided like six months ago and you literally have to go to keywords to find. In our DAO, we decided to like, first of all, to have an open Telegram channel to the people that would like to join the DAO. But then for the members, which today we are 11, we are having a Slack. And in Slack, at least you can hashtag and separate by topics. So as the DAO grows and this monster gets grown, at least the discussion is more or less uh, curated by topics and it's, it's easier to find but we still cannot go uh, uh, against that main discussion that is happening in the world, which is via chat channels. And um, I saw last week uh, the MakerDAO had a very important uh, uh, flexibility point because for the first time they went through a deficit of $4 million. The currency uh, maker lost the peg against the die. Some bot was able to buy ether at zero, and and that caused a massive uh, distortion in in their whole governance system. And in the end, uh, they have to have some sort of press release in a forum where uh, everything gets stated. But then you don't get lost in the discussion. Even if you join the Telegram channel, they're like, please refer to this and this and this, and the election is going to be on this day. But then you have a whole trail of why they are voting uh, their decision making. So some very important things that deserve the concern will always be pinned on the chat, but it's very important that people read and participate by the time it's happening and not just whenever they feel like, because sometimes you're missing an important decision and they need to grab like this notification attention. It's very hard in the blockchain space to, to follow up with everything that's going on. I bet everybody here has at least a uh, hundred telegram channels active and it's really hard to follow the discussion. So at least if the discussion is curated with hashtags, um, it might be some sort of reaching efficiency. Just, just yeah, following on from that, I, I think there's some really interesting, yeah, I think back to Jeff's comment around it's, it's not a binary, you need to sort of, sort of separate, yeah, as a DAO grows, I mean, it's very, it's relatively easy when it's a small group of people, but as it scales, yeah, this this overload of information and, and decisions, and it's just, just gets, just doesn't work. So we need, you know, and I actually love the sort of concepts of, of holacracy where they, where they, they bring in, 
circles, sort of areas of grouped roles together into a circle and they make certain decisions and they're sort of separated off for this area. And, and within you know, a person can have many roles, therefore can be in many circles, but that allows you to start breaking down the information, uh, the relevant information into these different circles and you can jump in and jump out as your role changes. Uh, in case of it, it gives a very, very fluid structure, but uh, yeah, that's all I'd say. Definitely, and I think if I can build on that, Mark, as as you know, these DAOs um, in very small groups, you know, can can be used fairly effectively to make online, or I mean, fairly effectively, I guess, is can be taken with a grain of salt. Um, but I think what we need to also consider uh, in the context of transparency and as these communities grow uh, is eliminating like time-based attack vectors. And I think one of the um, most exciting governance tools that I'd like to see um, implemented by uh, DAOs in like minimum format before it goes on chain and everything is, is conviction voting. Um, and this is basically uh, kind of, you can, you can check in at any time to the community sentiment of the DAO. So conviction voting is essentially like continuous, like vote streaming uh, or preference streaming. So you are always exerting your preference on, you know, in MakerDAO, maybe it is the, um, the, the parameters surrounding the peg rate. You know, if there is volatility, you know, that is threatening to break that, then, um, you know, people who are trusted in the MakerDAO ecosystem can alter their uh, streaming preference to address that. And then everyone in the community can see uh, the community reacting in real time, community sentiment building for, you know, the setting of these parameters to dynamically adapt to these systems rather than, you know, you have to go to MakerDAO's Telegram, you get a link to their forum, you get pointed to the vote, you get told the vote is between Tuesday and Friday and you know what, oh crap, I have to pick up my kids and my husband is sick and so on and so forth, you can't make the vote. So I think there are a lot of um, new opportunities for transparency and uh, bringing in the, the temporal dynamics of social situations into uh, our DAOs through new governance mechanisms. I found it interesting what you guys were talking about with the transparency of the conversations and the telegram groups. And what I thought was missing there was it seems like people are talking about this like it's inevitable that chats suck and that they're completely inadequate. I mean, nobody's saying, you know what, these conversations, in fact, even this conversation is completely inadequate for what we need in a real governance system. Um, so it, it, it's not, you know, the, the conviction voting is, is one way of saying, okay, we're gonna have a different tool for knowing what people think. Um, the other thing about, um, so that, so one limitation that I'm seeing people think, I'm just pointing out some thinking limitations is this is how our chats are and that's how it is rather than, Hey, what would different conversational tools look like? And this is one of the most, for me, one of the most interesting developments that we need to have in our society because we know that the chat tools that we have are causing people to be antisocial. We just know it. We, we can see it. It's everywhere. We have evidence. So I see so little talk about what would a good collaborative chat tool look like. I've seen some talk about it, but not much. And so I feel like rather than talking about how you wish it would be, you're like, well, this is just a problem. So we can solve that. The other limitation in thinking that is showing up is around voting. I don't think most decisions in the world are made by voting. And so that's another limitation of how we're thinking about transparency. And, and these are really important, in particular when we're talking about situations where the minority opinion is important. Majority rule is, is appropriate in some situations, 
But if you're trying to figure out how to set up your city, for example, let's just say a community or a city, and you've got some people who are a minority, that might be, let's just say it's elderly people, right? They're the minority of people in your community. But you don't want to just outvote them. They need certain services. Um, you know, so how do you think about conversations and decision making um, in ways that don't just limit you to voting? And then what other things would we want to be transparent about and in those situations or not be transparent about? I mean, the other thing about transparency is sometimes you just don't want your neighbor to know your opinion because you might be ostracized like Juliana was, was, was pointing out. You might just have a dissenting opinion. It might be that everybody thinks that, you know, we need two pickups a week of cardboard or pizza is a different situation, but nobody wants to say it because you don't want to be different. So where, where can we, you know, look in those? So those are just some questions to bring up that have kind of come up for me as you guys have been discussing. So. Just one, uh, one thought on that, Grace. Uh, I found it useful in trying to conceive new DAOs in trying to, uh, in the around sort of decision-making sort of process is thinking about different types of decision, the whole sort of leaf, branch, uh, trunk decisions, trying to sort of break them down in that way. So there's a leaf decision is something that somebody can make. Uh, if it's within their sort of role, they can just make it. They don't need to discuss it even with others, uh, but there's other, high level decisions which might impact others <clears throat> sort of branch decision and there's certain protocols around sharing in, sharing information or asking permission or et cetera et cetera and then you go back to the trunk decision which maybe triggers a more of a formal voting uh, thing because it could affect the sort of the the core of the DAO so that can be quite a useful uh, sort of technique, I think, getting that clarity on what type of decision and, and combined with clear role definitions and uh, yeah, that, that can help, help that process a little bit. Going back, going back, going a little bit, bit back to, to, to the original question about transparency as, as a such and, and leaving beside the problems around information flows that, that I think we, we are, are, are aware of. Uh, I would like to, to, to ask and to make the thought specifically about what are the reasons for not being transparent? Why can we find people in our organizations that are actually reluctant to uh, share information uh, with, with, with others? I mean, why, why transparency can be a problem? Yes, Lauren? Uh, do you wanna go? I don't know your name, I'm sorry, but yeah, I, I've already talked. Yeah, like uh, Victor, oh. My, my, my name is uh, here Sombra, it's kind of like a, a nickname, um, my artistic name, but um, you can call me Victor. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm also sick, uh, I'm not even uh, precluding that it may be COVID-19, but I think not, but there's a small chance, you never know. But anyway, um, like uh, exactly what, what, what being said before um, about a neighbor and because um, I missed part of the chat, so I'm right now sort of trying to figure out uh, the line what's been discussed already. Um, but I think that one of the th uh, if if everything is kind of like transparent by by design, kind of by sort of force or necessity, then um, it is inevitable. I think that people um, behave differently, or like people are aware of the fact that what they do is 
being known in a sort of automatic way to others and I think that this can um, create sort of a certain social dynamic um, that has its certain limitations I think um, also for example what is being discussed on these channels for example if you have a chat and um, people can index that and it's sort of um, automatically curated and uh, people can see what kind of opinion they have they can maybe I don't know like meet up in person and um, just discuss certain things outside of the uh, yeah system that 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 is uh, sort of the official channel um, for decision making and I think like also in 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 this world a lot of uh, decision making or things actually go via sort of like non-official channels. I don't even know like what is a good answer to 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 solve this, but I think it's kind of a human thing that that this happens. I'll just talk. Um, I, I think that there sometimes, um, you know, people forget that there there's actually a lot of private information, like um, what do you do in an organization if, you know, someone has, uh, if they're bipolar and they show a manic episode or something like, like it's just not so uh, clear cut that you want everything to be uh, transparent. I mean, they're just, there are a lot of personal issues that come up and so, uh, I don't know, certain things might need like a different level of opaqueness or delicacy to deal with them. So I think to guess points of uh, not being transparent, I think uh, there are gains in centralization. When you want to pass something really quick and really without too much discussion, then you hide in transparency and you get things pretty much fast tracked. So um, I would only consider the only benefit of not being transparent is getting like a quick decision uh, in like uh, between doors and, and, and getting it passed. But there are consequences because if, if the majority does not agree, then they're gonna have protests and manifests against that quick decision that was made. But um, there is a, an incredible gain in efficiency if not everything needs to be overly discussed in everything. So just um, to mention, that's how I see the only benefit of not being transparent. Sometimes it can be uh, interesting not to have it. But most of the time, it's important that, that people at least are aware of, of the discussions. I, yes, I, I'm passing I, the ball back to you because that's your yeah. point. Of, uh, yeah, yeah, cool. You know, I totally agree with that point and I've been in the situation and I empathize a lot with, with, with what you have said, but only in the case of a centralized organization. I mean, I understand how for a manager just not having to explain the whole context behind a decision and just transmitting the decision and executing it uh, without providing the, the needed information is boom, is, is efficient, is, um, is worth to, to do it that, that way. But when we are in, in the centralized organizations, that's actually something that could uh, be, be going against you somehow. And, 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 you, and, and you mentioned it yourself. I mean, maybe I just go for this, but without creating the context, without taking that effort in, in putting all people on this, on, or at least trying to trying to put all people on the, on the same level of, of information and awareness. I, I, uh, the only way to, to move the system forward that I personally see is, is being transparent. Yeah, pass it to Sombra. Yes. Yeah, let me just 
um, react real quick to this because um, I think it can also have something to do with people's or um, conversational um, style or something. I don't know. It's like a very um, a personal thing, um, but I'm not that good at group meetings. So um, when, for example, I was in this music collective that was um, kind of a decentralized organization. It was not a DAO, but it, it was sort of the decision making went collectively and, and was based on consensus. Um, and um, the decisions were taken in um, meetings. And I always uh, had the, the, the feeling that um, in the conversational process that was um, sort of the official channel, namely the meetings, um, my view or uh, input was completely like overruled by sort of, yeah, the, the, the social flows of, of other people. And if I had to get something done, um, once in a while, I kind of spoke to people more in a in a one-to-one -one setting to kind of explain why this or this was important to me because I could not get that point across in a group setting. And then, um, but sort of via the means of um, the, the the input of this, this person that I explained it to, um, in a group setting in a later stage, then my input was sort of brought into the whole um, whole thing. And then um, it's it's kind of almost like uh, delegated voting, but the the thing that sort of the, the act of um, giving my view to somebody with more social power, so to speak, was uh, an act that was in itself transparent. Like it was not necessarily um, always sort of recorded or known that um, this uh, in-between step came from me. It, it, it seems to me that I think too often in, in these DAOs, yeah, I, I feel as though we do need to be more open to a personal group of people having uh, a bigger picture view and the ability to sort of make decisions uh, on behalf of others, uh, but not in a in a sort of power control way. And we we typically think of that as you know the management team who have power in a traditional organisational hierarchy, and we think that's bad. That's that's cool, but I think we can because you know the, the Maker DAO problem recently that really highlighted the fact that you know they that they could have if there's been some some discourse around that they could have potentially got out of that better had they been able to make a quicker decision uh, around what to do via people at the right people at the right time blah blah but yes yeah, so I feel as though we can we can implement this sort of this concept in certain types of DAOs where you do have a kind of a, a, a smaller group of people who do have the authority to make decisions certain types of decisions quickly uh, but they are not the traditional sort of managers with, with power and, and greater stake. They're perhaps elected by all the stakeholders and they're re-elected quite regularly. So we bring in sort of, the sort of democratic principles into that. But, but yeah, but they do have some sort of different authority or some sort of different uh, ability to, to make certain types of decisions very, very quickly. Uh, yeah, that's my thought. Hi, could I, uh, I can't actually see everybody because I've had to switch to a mobile device, but um, um, if it's okay to go, I'd just like to come in on, on exactly that point actually, um, which is, really, it was this exact thing which was, um, which kind of motivated my personal interest and fascination with um, the work done on viable systems that I mentioned in the intro, um, which is, it, it goes, I don't know if anybody's familiar with, with the concepts there, but what I liked about it was the separation of, of roles without being in a sort of traditional management structure. You know, so there's a, an idea, a concept of strategic versus operational, and there's no competition between those things, and they can be circulated amongst actual individuals. It's just, it's just for this official, you know, so there's a focus to the participation and um, a, a, and a common, uh, a whole understanding of the way the system is working, the, the, those roles are distinct, so strategic versus operational. And also um, a, another cross-cutting concern is inward versus outward looking, which we might consider to be 
sort of let's say what's happening in the environment or competitiveness aspects perhaps and uh, being external influences um, versus internally focused uh, concerns and um, so it you know it, it and given the body of work that sits behind this and um, you know outside the DAO space but <clears throat> amongst cooperatives um, that have been going you know since the 50s and 60s I think um, you know I'm not an expert in this area but um, I know people who are <laughs> practitioners and academics and it's interesting to um, and powerful to hear them talk uh, about their experiences and provide some backups and so on so I think for me that feels like there's mileage to to take some of that learning and experience and take it to the digital space just my two cents there <laughs> One of the things that hasn't come up at all is um, space for testing. Um, and what I mean by that, when you were talking about um, being able to be transparent and being able to make quick decisions, when you were talking about, oh, how do we make quick decisions? That was something that came up for me. Like we're, we talk a lot about making the decision and very little about what leads up to it. And it feels like whenever we're making a consideration, there's going to be little tests along the way. And so let's just say we were trying to um, figure out um, how to how to improve the water quality in our in our environment. We might have something like you're allowed to take a bucket of water home and put stuff in it, or you're allowed to change the fertilizers on this percentage of your land to try out how that ha happens. Um, and so I feel like that there's the there's this um, it, we start talking about these like really really big decisions before we start talking about okay how can we do small tests and what would the transparency look like in small tests and what kind of autonomy could we give to organizations or people within our organizations to check something out before we do something on the whole DAO because I haven't seen very many you know especially when we talk about like maker DAO right they do stuff on the whole DAO, never on a small subset to see what happens. And in reality, a lot of times we do smaller trials. So, um, yeah, so I wanted to talk about, yeah, to hear a little bit about how people see that as helping decision making go fast and maybe less transparency, more transparency when you're trying out stuff. Sorry, I can't be 100% like very participatory right now just because I'm in the middle of something else. So you guys may have to, if that question sucks, somebody ask another question. So I'll just, just jump in here. So Martin, yeah, yeah really interested in, in what you were saying around uh, us, you know, just learning more from cooperatives and, and other, other other existing uh, ex experiments and, uh, and, and knowledge there. Uh, have you got any sort of good resources or articles or books or on the subjects? I'm, I'm really keen to go deeper in, in, in how that, how you can create a, uh, uh, I guess I'm really interested in the sort of the idea of creating more sophisticated DAO structures, but built on more of a sort of hierarchy of purpose uh, rather than a hierarchy of control so implementing sort of liquid democracy and in implementing sort of teal holocracy uh structures uh and i'd be really interested in uh whether or i guess anybody has got any good resources uh links whatever books they've read that uh can help me in my sort of learning uh, in this learning Sure, it's it's going to be quite hard to share them over this mobile device. Um, but if we have a way of uh, hooking up afterwards, then that would be true on the viable system side. Um, and you know, uh, also the, 
you know, the, connecting with the people who are actually in the space as well, um, uh, as in theory and practice as well. Um, and in terms of the bringing to the tech side, that's a work in progress. I mean, that's that's one of the reasons that you know, um, as a technologist, uh, I feel that um, Holochain offers probably the the the, the, the closest underlying um, uh, tech. Uh, fabric, let's call it, on which you can build those sorts of um, human systems. Um, uh, yeah, uh, DAOs, uh, essentially. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but they're, still, they're a little bit different with the, in terms of the agent-centric model versus something around tokens. Um, so, well, kind of radically different, actually. Yeah. Uh, how is Holochain going? Because I met, uh, I forget his name, the founder in New Zealand a couple of years ago, uh, one, of the, one of the key guys. It is, uh, and but I've, you know, there's obviously so much talk about the Ethereum ecosystem uh, and DeFi and all that sort of stuff. I haven't sort of followed Holochain. Uh, how is it, are you? Are you quite involved in that? And I think Grace said she was involved as well. Is it is it going sort of full steam ahead? Is it growing? Uh, I haven't been following it. It's probably not not the you know I wouldn't be the right person uh, right. being not on the core team or anything, and it's probably not the right forum for that. But um, right, right. it's going. Or else I, you know, I'm a, I'm a technical architect, you know, I, I want tools to fill full purposes, uh, the right tools for the job. And, you know, it's not fair on anybody if you're, if you're sort of betting on a donkey. So I don't believe that it's a, it's, it's a donkey at the moment. And, and irrespective of that, well, I think we can talk more generally about um, strict agent centric approaches where there isn't actually a common consensus. You have a you have your view, um, so you know it's there's a there's a there's a um, uh, a shift in in let's say mindset and the kind of system you're building. So it's not it's not right for every situ uh, situation, but um, and if you really do need a single source of truth at the same time amongst all stakeholders, then um, then a consensus you know a, a blockchain with a consensus um algorithm or approach is 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 the way to go but um um i for the situations i think i'm <laughs> describing um uh, there's you don't need that you can still build it in and build in parts of it but i think um good architecture will deal with uh, most of it and um uh, and that brings efficiency, actually, at a te talking of technical efficiency, um, because you don't need a global consensus. Um, always. You know, but it is, I, I think, sorry, I'm, <laughs> I could go on and on, but it is, I think it's early days in terms of uh, trying to build on that pattern. So it's not strictly um, about Holochain. Holochain is, is an implementation of, of a, 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 you know, a strict agent centric approach but um it's the it's the guarantees of data sharing on a dht which which bring sort of traditional multi-agent uh, software architectures to to if you like to the crypto space um and uh, and that's a that's a pretty powerful combination <laughs> but um yeah um uh, i'm happy to keep but for, in so far as it's useful, I'm happy to keep the conversation going. Um, off, off. I think uh, Zambra, I can't pronounce your name, you, you were going to speak. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, uh, you said that, uh, you know, like the, the, there's a shift in mindset that you don't always need um, a, a consensus blockchain. So are there uh, examples of DAOs that work um, without a consensus uh, system or Um, uh, it's there's it, well speaking from the um, Holochain architecture point of view, it's um, it's a, <clears throat> about bringing together the, the the nodes, if you like, representing agents, people, perhaps um, that um, that need to be in strict agreement with each other. So you're not having a global, um, you know, one massive ledger onto which uh, the entire world needs to agree. Um, you can separate, uh, you can parcel off um, elements 
if you like, subjects for agreement into, into their own DHT, which is strictly agreeing with each other and strictly validating with each other. And, and that way you can, you can have a, like a network of circles of guarantees and um, this this sort of approach I was uh, referring to when thinking about building, um, um, you know, reputation and trust into hierarchies, let's say, or, or, or uh, more more subtle um, ways of uh, of constructing um, what would otherwise be access control. If you have a single, um, you know, overarching consensus. Not, I, I don't. I, I don't think it's easy, though. <laughs> um, um, you know, so it's inefficient to build, perhaps. You know. Yeah, I think I think that's actually the reason why why Moloch DAO has been that successful because it allows people to to disagree on um, on the path that the organization is going and just disengage. Uh, from the DAO with the rage quitting option. So, in my view, the 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 right to agree on disagreeing is is very necessary in the in the in the in the DAO ecosystem. Yeah. If I could just come in with a um, hopefully not an off-topic point, but. Um... I used to do work on um, uh, making uh, legal contracts, legal agreements in intellectual property rights um, industry, um, sort of, uh, well, semi-computable at least. <clears throat> and one of the interesting sort of learnings there is that often people need to keep um, part of agreements they're making between each other, parties, um, deliberately unambiguous uh, sorry deliberately ambiguous so that it that what they want to do is come together in a room and they want to leave with an agreement that's what they want to do and everybody shares that objective but the detail is sometimes too hard to hammer out so what they uh, like to do is um sure sign off on an agreement but having deliberate um holes in parts of the, the fine detail, if you like. So that when it came to sort of um, putting that in sort of formal computing terms for, for, for automated <laughs> processing, then that presented a bit of a problem because um, it was neither agree or disagree. Um, it was just simply kind of left out. Um, and I think that, that even though that's in the more traditional kind of B2B processing space, I think that that situation is bound to somehow manifest itself where you know you do have a situation where where people want to walk away or want to be seen to agree at least um, um, uh, but they just have to, that just entails agreeing to disagree somehow I, I guess that but that implies which I agree with that you need some sort of dispute resolution system which you can resort to because what you're saying yes sometimes it's just it's more effort more time it's not practical to to nut it right down to the level of detail you know cover off all the edge cases it's just impractical in real life so we have to accept that and that's you know and and that's going to happen in the digital world as well as the, the non-digital world and therefore yeah we need you know things like i mean i'm following the aragon court thing which i think is really interesting uh where you need some sort of system where you can, uh, on the sort of blockchain world, you can, uh, when those inevitable uh, ambiguities arise, you need the reasonable, some sort of person or system that applies reasonableness to, to sorting out that issue. And, and, that's, and that can work. Well, I'd, I'd go even further and say, um, perhaps it's okay to not have a resolution on every detail. You know, perhaps there's a, a kind of a way of saying, you know, let's late bind on parts of, um, you know, I'm not being a good technologist here, you know, I'd like to nail as much as I possibly can unambiguously, but, um, but I, I kind of see the value in, in, in leaving, in leaving ambi ambiguity there. 
um, and knowing that it's at least bounding the ambiguity as a way of bringing efficiency in, um, perhaps. Um, and I think that's one of the offerings of Holochain. Sorry, Martin, were you done? Or? Uh, yeah, I am done. Uh, you could, I'll just ramble on for, <laughs> if you don't stop me, so thank you. <laughs> no problem. Um, the I think that's the main offer of Holochain is that with an agent-centric architecture, you're not uh, guaranteeing some global state of the world because there is no global state of the world. And this is the main point that agent-centric architectures make is that having the data-centric model of blockchain of uh, sorry Bitcoin or Ethereum uh, guarantees that there is some you know universal truth that everyone has to agree to as opposed to in an agent centric architecture you can have localized truths that hold for certain groups that other groups can choose not to participate in and this allows for more diversity of opinion uh, and empowerment of the individual um, but that said i don't think there is one architecture to rule them all uh, because inherently DAOs are social systems and if you don't define consensus and governance then it comes through natural social processes and actually if you don't define them you get a lot more of the like kind of strongman or you know like gossip or or you know the governance is always defined even if you don't define it uh so there's interesting um i guess I think DAOs are more social systems than we give them credit for. From what I've seen in a lot of the, the DAO space, we think that there is one architecture, there is one governance mechanism that will solve the social problem. Uh, and I, I think we need to treat them more like commons uh, and more, it, like Mark said, mentioned, um, dispute resolution systems, absolutely necessary. Um, novel governance mechanisms, absolutely necessary. Novel fundraising mechanisms, um, and then determining the social uh, values of this group and the purpose of this group. I saw that question uh, typed up by Lauren, which thank you, by the way, on mobile. This is really helpful to have all of these uh, chats just kind of bite sized. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of exploration of DAOs as social systems and what architectures suit what communities for what purposes best. Is well, it Mark given, who just given left? the time, maybe it's a good time for people to do a checkout because we've got another 15 minutes. So maybe we can just say what they're taking away, what they learned, and you know, just go around and then um, wrap up. I I heard so much from Holochain, and it's the first time that I'm actually hearing about this. So I spent the, the past minutes just taking a look at the project and all that. So to me, um, I learned a lot and um, it's still like a learning curve, but interesting discussions. I don't know if this uh, gets published somewhere, but how can I follow up? And thank you for allowing me to be in this call. Just go. <laughs> um, yeah, can you hear sound? Because the mic is not optimal. But yeah, um, one of the most unexpected but nice things is that the, the topic came on uh, chats and on like uh, how chats can be inadequate and um, maybe like make people antisocial. And it was one of the things that I was noticing from like the um, decentralized governance chat because I just got a bit involved in the whole um, world of what's going on and um, when there's like several chats and there's so much going on I indeed like feel a bit of like overwhelmed or like um, maybe inappropriately lurking even though that's not um, what I want to do but then it's it's kind of yeah I wish there were um, a bit less uh, like how you say um or like some some formal feedback uh 
options or something to say, okay, I've read this or like I will get into this later or anything um, other than typing something myself so that I don't always have something to say. And um, this came also back in the, in the discussion how um, conspiracy and chats was related. So that, that's the main thing that I'm taking. What I personally bring bring home is is more more awareness about the need in having good information flows for for our organization. Uh, for me, that's personally a problem. For what I I, I don't see so far a, a, an optimal solution information flows that might be like the first problem for for reaching a transparency the transparency that a DAO needs um can i just i wave my water bottle around um if i go next um yeah um uh Interesting, really interesting chat. I mean, I think what I took away um, was that, uh, well, on this call, there's this just um, a remarkable breadth of knowledge, uh, as well as probably a depth of knowledge um, across different projects. Um, uh, um, that's, yeah, that, that's quite, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, learned, I, I learned a lot personally from that. Um, that brought some sort of context to the, the pieces, the couple of years I've done with delegated proof of stake, and um, and uh, the um, I guess I'm just I, I still I'm still un not clear as to uh, you know the uh, <laughs> a uh, the situations with um, you know offline. Uh, conversations, you know, out of band conversations, and how you bring those um, together with the with the mechanisms of making decisions. Obviously, uh, voting being being uh, a primary one, but um, I think there's a long way to go there. And this point about being able to experiment and find out what works, I think, is absolutely critical. Um, so there's something here about a process. Uh, I think by uh, um, by which we collectively are able to um, work through these problems and, and kind of, you know, there's a kind of meta process going uh, there for, for me. Um, and thank you all. Cool, did, did everybody sort of say their closing words? Is, did we leave anybody out? I think we left me out because my uh, my internet fell out. Uh, so just yeah, so we're just closing marks. Okay, so I'll uh, finish off. Uh, yeah, no, I thought yeah, I thought it was really interesting breadth of discussion and uh, yeah, really interesting. Yeah, I guess that what I got most out of this is actually starting to sort of connect and identify some of the people who are playing in the space and learning a bit about what they know. Uh, so. Yeah, that's, that's sort of the major value I got out of this. I just kind of, uh, I just kind of came up with something. I almost think that um, an, to have more transparency, um, I think a key part of that is actually reducing the amount of uh, information and clarifying what's going on because you can be totally transparent but if if necessitates like if in order to understand what's going on in the governance, you have to go through uh, five thousand messages on twenty different channels that may be transparent, but it's not accessible. So I think that uh, transparency in this day and age means somehow condensing some of that information so that maybe you uh, it's easier to process. I completely agree with that. Knowledge management, yeah. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. attention management, I think, even because there's there's so much wonderful information and uh, you know encoding that into the shortest uh but still uh not lossy signal is is really important, especially in a space with with so much going on. That's a really good point, Lauren. I, I would say I would add to that that you know we, we just had for Kiko Lab we had these um, discussions and at reducing it down to some digestible parts was so much work. It was an unbelievable amount of work to to whittle down information. It's so much harder to get things to get things down to their essential points than it is to make a boatload of information. Right. And that's, that's the almost invisible work. And I see you've been doing that through this call and it's been so helpful, uh, but it's also, it's some of that invisible work. I completely agree, but, but very necessary. And I think, you know, unearthing that and, and, and pointing to it as there's a lot of, there's a lot of invisible labor in, in these groups, in these social systems that I think uh, we need to do a better job at recognizing the value of coming up with alternative uh, you know, value systems that can respect that um, for for the value it delivers. Yeah, can I say something short about this? Because um, this leads to another thing that can be discussed in a, a later meeting, I think. Um, but it's 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 very relevant. Being trained as an historian, um, you know, like to me, it it, it uh, is also um, getting into the problem that the uh getting the core out of a large piece of information of like human conversation is also a matter of like selection and choice and then a sort of who who is deciding um what is actually the core message um that emerges from like a large body of information and that yet again um can be like differences in consensus on like what the the sort of historical narrative is on and when it's like a small group it's 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 not so um difficult but when a DAO gets like really big and scaled up then you may even get like differences in opinion in um what what the sort of the 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 core curriculum is of what somebody needs to learn and go through in order to understand how the structure has come into being For sure. And so, it's, but do people generally agree that it is, is, is it is this combination of better information, sort of uh, management uh, and transparency, but also delegated authority, or this 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 in practice this ability to sort of acknowledge that hey i'm not interested in this part of the business or this these types of decisions because i don't have the expertise or i don't have the time but i am interested in these so i don't need to see that information i don't need to vote on that thing so it's kind of this this clever combination of some of these techniques that ultimately is going to sort of win win through is that do people agree with that generally my, I mean, my take on that is that, again, what, what Jeff said, I would just reiterate, like, there's not a one size fits all system. And some DAOs are very, I mean, some things are going to look more like a bunch of different groups. Like, if you think about organizations that are sort of loosely put together, like, you know, like, 4-H clubs or something, right? Like the, everybody's got a club in their thing and they have something or the TED Talks, right? Anybody can make a TED Talk and they're kind of connected to everybody else and there's some standards, but they don't have connections to each other. There's just really different implications of what is a DAO. And you might have a DAO deciding to own a centralized organization because the DAO realized, oh, we can only be this many people making a decision together, but we want something bigger. You could have a DAO own a centralized organization. I feel like there's going to be so many configurations that there isn't one answer to that or one answer to anything. So, um, so I just want to wrap up and say thank you guys for kind of self generating this thing because I've been in the middle of some other stuff that I'm dealing with right now. And, um, 
and I have to say, you know, I totally uh, reiterate also what Paul, uh, Mark said, like, wow, this is just a really amazing group and we have a lot of great people and a lot of contributions. Uh, Typhoon, we're just finishing up, but welcome. I uh, hope you'll be able to join our next call. Um, and it's just really an amazing group. Like there's, I don't feel like, oh, I've got to moderate this or add my knowledge in order for these to be just absolutely amazing calls every week. And this will be posted and so will Lauren's notes. I took a copy of them, but Lauren, you're welcome to also post them in the forum since they are your notes. Um, so that's all posted in the DIGA Foundation forum. So also anything that you think of later, links, anything, you can always post that as an add-on to that. So these are all made public. So thanks everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that meaning, a meaningful <laughs> cough. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Grace, for organizing. That's it's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank, thanks. You. Thanks. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Catch you guys Stay again safe, soon. Guys. Yeah. Bye bye.